music that has been selected for our service today reflects an attitude of inclusion, an encouragement towards acceptance of one another, of multicultural influences, and a diverse blending of voices and perspectives. Sometimes this blending of voices is literally a blending of voices, like our choir just shared with us. As we explore these ideas of acceptance and inclusion, I encourage you to consider the role that music plays in reinforcing our attitudes, our ideologies, and our theologies. I'd like to start with a tale of two kings. The first king, Representative Steve King of Iowa, <laughs> has been in the news recently for his comments in an interview with the New York Times, where he said, quote, white nationalist, white supremacist, Western civilization, how did that language become offensive? It is baffling that he fails to see the problem with these terms. And by putting them on a pedestal with Western civilization, it's troubling how he attempts to normalize and elevate dangerous and harmful ideologies like white supremacy and white nationalism. But even more troubling is that this isn't the first time he's made statements like this. Back in March of 2017, he tweeted, culture and demographics are our destiny. We can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. There are, as I'm sure you noticed, many things that are problematic about this statement. The way he casually mentions somebody else's babies to stoke suspicion and fear of cultures and worldviews different from his own and a deep distrust of anyone who thinks acts, or looks different. That when he says, restore our civilization, he implies that our civilization has slipped away from greatness. And in the culture that he advocates returning to, a culture of white supremacy, inciting fear of the other is essential to justify oppression of that other. White supremacy culture uses fear to keep factions divided against each other and to preserve power in the hands of the white patriarchy. That is the perspective of one king. But there is another king, Martin Luther King Jr., whose life and legacy we celebrate as a national holiday tomorrow. Martin Luther King Jr. had a much different vision of America than Steve King. MLK's vision was not about dividing, excluding, and oppressing. It was not about fearing and othering. His vision, which he called the beloved community, was of a diverse, inclusive, peaceful, and just world a world in harmony. This king identified three obstacles that stood in the way of humanity realizing the beloved community. Poverty, militarism, racism. He called these the triple evils. And unfortunately, 51 years after King's assassination, we have made little progress eliminating these evils from society. In fact, it somehow seems that there are more evils facing American society today, and that they are at least as strong and present as they were in the civil rights era of the 1960s. But today, King's three evils seem to have expanded to become what Iris Young calls the five faces of oppression, which are exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. 
in understanding the complex ways that these forms of oppression are connected, we, all of us, who are learning about how to work for justice in the modern world, have come to understand that our work must be intersectional. That no single justice issue will prevail against the system that is designed to divide and oppress. Only if we can come together to work for intersectional justice will anyone truly be free. The best example of this intersectional justice work being done today is by Reverend William Barber and his Poor People's Campaign, a name that he borrowed and revived from Martin Luther King's 1967 movement to combat poverty. Barber's style of coalition building across issues of injustice and marginalization is calling all people of conscience to come together across diverse theological, cultural, and racial differences to demand a better, more just society. His method is one of calling people in rather than calling them out. He is building bridges between our divisions. I recently read an article by Vu Le, the director of a nonprofit organization in Seattle that works to empower leaders of color and organizations led by communities of color. And in this article, he points out two different approaches to justice work, that of the social justice warrior and that of the bridge builder. He writes, we must be strategic about who is taking on what role in fighting injustice. Some of us are warriors out there vocally calling out racism and other forms of oppression. Others are bridge builders, helping to teach, heal, and connect people. Both types of activism call out and call in. Working in parallel are needed. Now it's true, there are different styles of confronting injustice. And we certainly need to be open and willing to hear when we've said or done something offensive, even if that wasn't our intention. Impact and intent are not the same thing. And we can cause harm, even if we didn't mean to. The trick is not to respond by defending our offensive actions, but by being curious to understand why our actions were painful to someone. This is the getting called out, and it can feel really uncomfortable. But there is also room in our justice work for the calling in, for the teaching and for the healing that comes from building up relationships. So we can be social justice warriors and march in the streets, just as Reverend Angela and other members of First Unitarian are doing right now in downtown Albuquerque at the Women's March. And, and we can be bridge builders. Taking the example from William Barber and from Martin Luther King Jr. before him, we can get to know each other. That starts right here in our congregation but it extends to others beyond our walls, even and especially to those others who may seem pretty different. We can form relationships across diverse identities and communities. By building bridges, we can journey together toward a new world in which the five faces of oppression dare not show their ugly faces, because enough people say, not here. And remember, as we do this work, to keep a song in your heart. Because if what we want is a world in harmony, we're going to need some music to help us get there. That sounds like a cue. I invite you to rise and body your spirit. We're going to sing number 1023, Building Bridges. And we'll start out singing it together, and then I've got some folks from the choir. We're going to try the round. So I've got four people from the choir who are going to come help the groups get started.
making music or listening to music, sharing a meal or two, sharing a meal, are two of the easiest ways to enter into cross-cultural engagement. Breaking bread together is a time-honored signifier of hospitality. Singing together takes some preparation, just like cooking and serving a delicious meal. When we sing together, maybe we have to learn a new language or absorb an unfamiliar musical style or take a chance that we're singing one line over here and they're singing another line over here and it all comes together in beautiful harmony. But that singing together reminds us that all people, all people have breath that moves in and out of their lungs, hearts that beat with the music and emotions that respond to consonant and dissonant harmonies. Food and music, good starting places for the real work of the journey building bridges to overcome differences in opinion and focus on the hard work of justice. We can only go so far when we meet on Sunday morning in this beautiful familiar room with our mostly familiar congregation, welcoming our visitors and newcomers. Even if we explore music from many times and places and tell the stories and strive to understand the meaning carried in the history of the songs, until that music serves as a bridge to the flesh and blood face-to-face -face community building, we might as well be sitting in a lecture hall for Music Appreciation 101. Coming up next month, we actually have a wonderful opportunity co to connect with folks from all over Albuquerque. First Unitarian is partnering with the New Mexico Black History Organizing Committee on the second annual One New Mexico Gospel Choir. This last year was the first year we did this, and this year I'm working with Kathy McGill and Cynthia Laughlin on the planning committee for the second annual Gospel Choir. We will be hosting two rehearsals and a potluck here at this church for all of the singers in this citywide interfaith intergenerational choir directed by Dr. Stevie Dewan Springer. We'll have two special guests, songwriter V. Michael McKay and recording artist Treva Jones, both from Houston, Texas. Now, if singing in a gospel choir is not your thing, you can help with the potluck, or you can attend the free concert at 3 o'clock Sunday, February 24th at the Continuing Education College edu Auditorium on UNM campus. This is the real deal. This is music that is a fusion of the emotionally exciting musical elements, and the powerful Christian faith of the American black church. Gospel literally means the good news of redemption through the Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that for some of us Unitarians, the language of gospel praise may feel like a bigger stretch from UU theology than, say, a Catholic liberation hymn in Spanish. But all of these ways, all of these musics are ways of reaching out and connecting and creating that harmony together, our common cause, always, no matter our theology, is love. So I invite you to walk with us, sing with us, break bread with us, make peace with us, speak the truth with us, begin again in love, in hope, in peace with us. I invite you to rise and body your spirit and pull out that insert to sing No Other People's Children with the choir. We'll practice a little. We've got time to practice. And then we'll sing through 